Okay. Um, hello. <laughs> Greetings. Greetings. Greetings, Father God. Hallelujah. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Lord, uh, we just ask that you just help us, Lord, offer the praise our lips to you that we can receive and return your wonderful joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, last week uh, we got into a little... Uh, it was uh, anyway. It was different because I was giving you some background information about David and Goliath, which is uh, one Samuel 17, uh, one through I think uh, uh, 58, 58 verses. Can't cover 58 verses in one session, that's for sure. Lucky, but I broke it in half. And last last week I gave you the background. So there was nothing really exciting about the, the, the message last week. It was just. God was telling us, this is how it is. He gave us the setting, and he gave us the people, and the such, and so forth. So I told him a little bit of things that uh, the uh, uh, Goliath and the Philistines had invaded the land, and the Philistines were, were there was a, uh, the, the people were on a hill. I'm just reviewing quickly. The people were on, this was uh, Saul and the Israelites, on, on one mountain, and uh, uh, Goliath and the Philistines on another mountain. Now, what we're looking here is saved and unsaved. Uh, uh, Saul and, uh, and uh, in the Old Testament, Saul represents the believers. Okay, which means the church. Okay. Well, the church was not complete in the Old Testament, was it? No. no. But that's what Saul represents, the church, because God, uh, uh, Israel had no, had no king, and uh, uh, the, uh, the people, uh, God wanted, had somebody in mind, but no, the people wanted Saul. So, so God gave him Saul. They insisted upon Saul. I gave you what you want, okay? If you want uh, drugs and alcohol, I'll give them to you. Kill yourself. It's up to you. All right? So, so anyway, they got Saul, and Saul was uh, the leader of the uh, uh, church at that time, and the kingdom as well, okay, king church, king priest, I should say, at that time. And he was chasing after David, uh, uh, pretty much to kill him. Oh, no, this is before. I am ahead of myself. So at this time, Saul was uh, just ahead of, the, ahead of the church, the position. Now, you need to see this. So let's, let's look at it here. I opened up. I give you types and shadows because I'm dealing with types and shadows today. Okay, uh, types and shadow means, well, let's say for example, uh, uh, we have. Uh, let me just do it like this. We have Jesse, which equals Father God, uh, in type and shadow. We have David, which equals Jesus Christ. Why does David equal in type and shadow Jesus Christ? Because he's in the lineage of Jesus, number one. Okay, and he he was. And what a type and shadow means is it's not the same thing as Jesus. But it's a part of Jesus. It's a, it's a type. It's 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 the same mannerisms uh, for the most part, uh, but not fully, just partially. And so David was a, 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 a how do I say a partial fulfillment, let's say like that, of Jesus Christ. A partial fulfillment. Okay. Well, we're going to focus on David today because we know that he's a partial fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Now let's see what, what else we had here. We had uh, uh, the keeper. Uh, and what, is, what had happened is, is that uh, uh, David had, uh, David's uh, three eldest brothers had gone to, to fight the battle with Saul, and David had returned home, r away from Saul, had returned home. The, in other words, David had, had left this place and gone home. And what was he doing at home? To take care of the sheep. That's the deal, take care of the sheep. He was in mind of the sheep, okay? Then, uh, um, then David got a mind, and uh, uh, David's father sent some some victuals, some food with uh, with David, and sent him back into the camp again. But David got a mind also uh, that uh, uh, well, let's just see. So then after this, David went went back, okay, and uh, and he entered into into the camp, and he, and he and he saw what was happening, and what was happening was this. That's the giant Goliath. And these are all the, <laughs> the little people on the other side. 
and there was a stream of water in between them in the valley. What does water represent in the Bible? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay. What was separating what was separating Saul from Goliath? Holy Spirit. So Saul was believers who weren't actually full. They were just coming along people, just like you and I. Okay, now, it wasn't full like, hey, I believe everything, and I'm going to go to, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and walk on water. It wasn't that extreme. It was that they were people who were having a hard time figuring out what was going on, just like you and me. Okay, and that included Saul. Okay, because uh, anyway, so what happened is Saul came into the, uh, or David came back into the camp. And, he, and what was happening is Goliath was coming down from, the, uh, from his mountain twice a day, uh, uh, presumably at, at 9 o'clock in the morning, which was a prayer time, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which was a prayer time. Because this is all about God now, okay? So here Goliath was coming down at prayer time uh, two times a day saying, You Philistine, or I'm sorry, he was a Philistine, you uh, uh, Israelites, are cowards and afraid of me and so on. So send me a man that can fight with me. Remember, Goliath was about 12 foot tall. <laughs> that's like twice my size. That's up to the top of that, that thing there. Okay. That, uh, either one of them. So, uh, and it probably weighed maybe 12, 1500 pounds at, at that height anyway. Okay. So, and he had a coat of mail. Remember the coat, the, all the armor that Saul had was all brass. And in the Bible, brass, uh, in one of the Hebrew definitions of of brass is sin, or is a uh, uh, what I want to say. I've lost it. Uh, so oh, yeah, filthiness, filthiness, filthiness. That's sin. Okay. So Saul, or not Saul, but the last armor all had to do with filthiness, sin. His his breastplate, his his uh, uh, greaves, everything about him. Uh, was in terms of filthiness because he he was a sin. He was now Goliath was at this time when we're introduced to Goliath represents sin. Okay, that's a sin that comes against us. We're here over here, and Goliath can our sin comes down and visits us. Here they visited us twice a day, and what Goliath was doing is he defying the army of the living God, saying, "Ah, oh, you're no good. You're stupid. You're this, that, or so on." Coming against God on top of it, okay? Twice a day. How many times does sin visit you? A day? How many times do you think about things you shouldn't, you know, that are not, not godly things? See? That's, see, that's that, that, that mind in you that, uh, that's, that, that's your natural man who, if you're saving the morning again, your natural man is a, is a zombie. He's dead, okay? He is a dead dude. The problem is he doesn't know it. And he thinks he's still trying to stay in charge. But you have the Holy Spirit inside you now who's trying, who's coming on against that and is gradually gaining control over the natural man aspect that you, that you still have. So you're, you're eradicating your natural man little by little as you learn more and more of God and you're, uh, you're uh, increasing your spiritual man. That's God, okay? So, uh, so life was coming down twice, twice, twice a week or twice a day uh, over a period of 40 days. 40 days in the Bible, it means a time of testing. It's the same thing as when the Israelites left Israel or left uh, uh, Egypt. They spent 40, 40 years in the wilderness, time of testing. And how many people of those, probably approximately three, four million people who left Egypt and went back to Israel, how many people of those actually went into, into the promised land? All right? Two. Out of two and a half million people or so, or even more than that, two were allowed to go into the promised land. What does the promised land represent in the Bible? Heaven. Symbol of heaven. Only two guys made it. Okay. <laughs> so, so, it appears that it's like, and it is, it's a wide open door, but, you know, it takes some... Uh, how will I say? Well, just bear in mind, only two guys made it. Would, would that have been one? If you were back in that, that bunch of uh, several million people, Israelites, uh, wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years, are you one of those that God wouldn't have let into the heaven? You need to think about that because 
only two got in. That doesn't mean that same proportion applies now, but perhaps it does. But it's a, it's a worldwide proportion. Of all the people in the world, let us say only 2%, if you want to do it like that, uh, will make it into heaven. And that's probably pretty good. Look at all the Christian congregations we have, all the different denominations we have, about five or, well, about 600, I think, uh, different denominations. And how many of them are saved and born again? Very, very few. Very, very few. So in other denominations, they think, they think this way, that way, so so on. But very, very few are saved and born again. And what did Jesus say about that? He said, John 3, 3, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus right there is telling everybody, you got to be born again to get to heaven. All right. And uh, let's, let's say, give, uh, do it like 98% of our religions don't believe that, of the, of the uh, 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 Protestant types of religions uh, and Catholicism and such. Don't believe it. I'm getting off a little bit of generalization. I was giving you some things here. So here we have, Everything is being pictured now. We have evil coming against good, as good as it was at that time. How good can you be without Jesus? How good can you be, really, without Jesus? You can, you can come to the mission, you can, you can work, you can wash dishes, and you can move stuff around and uh, uh, cart stuff out to the people and give people fill boxes with groceries and do all kinds of things. How good can you be without Jesus? Because without Jesus, what you're doing is you're working your way to heaven. You're just working your way to heaven. No matter what you do, it don't matter. Because it's not inspired by God. Right. You have to have God inside you. How do you get God inside you? Say the prayer. Okay, you ask God, the Lord God to come inside you. you Jesus Christ inside you. When you have Jesus Christ inside you, because you're saved and born again, then things will start working for you in the right way. And all those things that you're doing for the Lord, for the kingdom of God, are credited to you. But if you're not saved and born again, you can work uh, like Mother T uh, Teresa. As far as I know, now I'm just telling you that, that no one, that she's ever never said the prayer to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Now in the Old Testament, uh, people didn't say a prayer for Jesus either because they didn't have Jesus with them, but they were imputed for righteousness. God would look at their hearts and see, oh, you did, you did this, that, you can go to heaven, so on, so on. And the New Testament says we're still imputed for righteousness. God still looks at our hearts, okay? So I don't know who is saved and who's not saved, and I can't stand here and tell you absolutely if you do not say that prayer exactly, you can't go to heaven. I can't say that because it's imputed for righteousness. And there are people out there, I'm sure, who are, are uh, godly, holy people in their heart, and God's going to look at that and impute them, even though they've never said the prayer, they're gonna, gonna, God's going to send them to heaven too. I believe that's, that's how it's going to be. It has to be that way. Okay. All right. But it's, it's what you do. Well, here. So anyway, with, with all that in mind, uh, uh, let's uh, uh, start uh, seeing. What, now we get to the action. Now we get to the, because this is symbolism. The Bible is all symbolism. If you know the symbols, you can put them together and understand what God's saying. But you can't possibly understand the Bible if you don't know what the symbols are, what the symbols mean. Because it's all symbolism. Because if God spoke to you in God's own language, it would be, ha, you would be dead. Okay? He has to speak to you in symbols so that, so that you can understand, because you can't understand his language. You have to be, you have to be a Holy Spirit, I'm going to do it like that, to understand God's language. And that's why the Bible says in the book of John that the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. All you got to do is take it in. God didn't never say you got to understand it, that Bible, that book there. All you got to do is take it in. And God, through Jesus Christ, if, if you have the Holy Spirit inside you, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit will explain it to you. Okay? And if you're, and if you're not saved, not born again, you can read that Bible a thousand times and it's going to get you no place. Period. That's it. Okay. So, I said here, uh, we're looking at these types of uh, shadows. Uh, Jesse represents Father God. Uh, uh, David represents Jesus Christ. The Keeper represents the Holy Spirit. Saul represents the worldly church under the hidden influence of Satan. Okay. Goliath represents Antichrist. Okay. And the man that bear the shield 
uh, equals the fake news media. Believe it or not, that brings us right up to the present, and I'll show you that. Okay. Uh, uh, which, uh, uh, and the, the Philistine represents unsafe man, the un unsafe man composite. Now, last week we did the first uh, 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 37 verses, okay? And there was talk about Goliath in there and this, that, so on and so on. Now, this week from, from, uh, from verse 1 Samuel 17, 38 on, which is a whole different deal now, okay, we're going to enter the heavy part. Goliath is mentioned twice. In the entire, actually in the, in the entire chapter of 1 Samuel 17, all 58 verses, Goliath is mentioned only twice. Well, that's kind of interesting. We're talking all about Goliath all the time, but we only mention him twice. What happens is this, though. There's a higher picture than Goliath representing your sin. A higher picture, even higher than, uh, higher than the concept of Goliath, this evil person with all his sinful armor around, so it's like relish out and doing bad things. That represents your sin, but there's a, a higher picture than that. It's called the nation of Philistine, Philistine the Philistines. The Philistines represent, because that's what Goliath was. He was, Goliath, he, he was a Philistine from the nation of Philistine. He, he lived in Gath, and he, he was uh, a nation of Philistine. And he represents not only in the, uh, sin that we, can, uh, we deal with, but now if we pop it up, we're going to see Phil Philistines represents all unsaved people. Was, was Goliath unsaved? Absolutely. So he comes under that category. But he's under that category. He doesn't believe it. He's under it. So that's the highest concept. It's all unsaved people. So what we're going to look at now is the difference between... <laughs> well, let's just look and see. All right. This is an end-time big picture prophecy now. So starting in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 and 39. And I'll read the black face first. That's directly from the Bible. All the, the other stuff is, is coming from it myself and the Holy Spirit, and you've got to figure out which one. <laughs> 1 Samuel 17, verses, two verses now, uh, 38 and 39. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he, and because uh, what had happened is David would, had come to the camp and saw what was going on. That, that, that He saw the, 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 the Goliath, the Philistine, come down and, uh, and yell at all the people of that, and he said, well, they're all, we're afraid. He gave us, well, what's going to happen to the guy that kills this Philistine? All right. Uh, to the people. And the people said, well, he's going to get this and this. And he's going to get this. Fear. They, they went through a bunch of favors he's going to get. Okay. Uh, and then, so, and David said, I can do this. I'm going to do this. Uh, okay. And then, and then Saul, the King Saul heard about what uh, David had said. And then, then now we go to when they meet, they meet each other. And, and Saul armed David with his armor. So Saul is, Saul, David had convinced Saul that he, he's going to go out and fight the Philistine. Uh, and then Saul armed David with his armor. Now, Tom, would you stand up, please? Why don't you focus on Tom? See Tom in a suit? And, and uh, some, some uh, 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 symbols around his neck, and, and was that doesn't look good, right? Okay, all right. Sometimes sit back down again. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, what we wear is what we are, boys and girls. What we wear is what we are. That's our outer covering. Okay, our outer covering. What we wear is what we are, and it's and it, it, you know when you start thinking about it that even when yourself when you when you dress certain types of dress and things and whatever mean, mean things to you too. They mean things to other people as well. Okay. Uh, for example, I wasn't too sure whether a yellow tie with a green shirt was going to make it today. <laughs> but but I, I said, well, I mean, I, <laughs> give it a shot. But, uh, now, so knowing that you are what you wear, okay, is an indication. I don't know if do it like this. What you wear is an indication of what you are. Okay, See, it symbolizes what you are, right? Uh, uh, okay, and we all know that. Now, knowing that, and Saul, who was a, a bad guy, okay, he was, a, he was supposedly be a Christian, but he was leading uh, the church and he was leading the, uh, 
uh, a kingdom, but he was not a nice guy. He was having some real problems. It's very questionable whether he was ever saved. In fact, how Saul died is he committed suicide. Okay, and I'm not, and, and that's taking your own life, and that's, that's against one of, the, one of the commandments, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so I mentioned that to you. So let's go back to those and see this, now read this. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put on a helmet of brass upon his head, and he also armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. Now this is pretty interesting. Let's go back and see what happened here. And Saul, which is a type and shadow of the worldly church, armed David. David was a youth of about 15 years old, something in that area, approximation, okay. He armed David with his armor. Now David's a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. What kind of armor? Well, here, let's, let's read and see. With his, with his armor, uh, and Saul armed David with his armor, uh, that means Saul's own covering. What we are is revealed by what we wear. What we are is revealed by what we wear, okay, all right. He armed, uh, armed David with his, uh, with his own armor, and he put, uh, he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Brass is filthiness. That's Saul's armor. Saul's in a lot of trouble. He's a sinner, okay. He put, put a helmet of brass on David's head. A helmet would be a defender of worldly thoughts, a brass, which is a symbol of sin upon his head. Now let's look at the uh, one, first footnote here where it tells you that in uh, number one, uh, in the Hebrew copper base as com uh, brass is base as compared with uh, gold or silver. Base means lowly as compared with gold or silver. Brazen, filthiness, sin, okay? So now all of a sudden, because Saul's decided that, well, he's going to let David go ahead and do this thing, see if he can do it. So he starts to arm David with his own <coughs> armor. <coughs> Did David want to think like Saul? No. no. I don't think so. And that's the, and we have here, and then he says, this, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Sin on his head. So that's where you're, that holds your thoughts, okay? Those are Saul's thoughts, okay? What Saul is doing, he's teaching, uh, he's, he represents the church, he's teaching David his ways. What kind of ways are his ways? Natural ways. Don't work. Natural ways are brass, sin. Only spiritual ways work. And what, he's, what Saul is doing, in effect, is he, he's teaching David now uh, all his own sinful, evil ways. He's the church, and that's what the church does. Churches that are, a lot of churches uh, don't have their, the, 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 the deal right, okay? They're misdirecting their people. They're, they're confusing their people. And they're teaching them things that are not scriptural, that are not of God. And that's what Saul was doing to David, okay? Because that's what all Saul had, all right? And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a, put a, a helmet of brass upon his head. And he also armed him with a coat of mail. A coat of mail in, in, in Hebrew means as composed or covered of, with joints or plates of metal. A coat of mail. Like fish scales. This is my concept. They're like fish scales on you, okay? Presumably a brass. One, one, uh, now, that uh, well, uh, comes from uh, the, coat, the coat of armor that uh, um, uh, Goliath had from 1 Samuel 17.5. And specifically, because you're thinking now about this sinful guy and his coat of brass, and those individual little fish scales, individual sins. Multiple, myriad, hundreds, thousands of little bitty sins. Not little bitty, but sins, actually. Just sins. That's the, how, see how weird this is all kind of fitting in a little bit? Okay, all right. And okay, he armed, he armed uh, uh, David with a coat of mail, and David girded, that's belted his, that Saul's sword upon Saul's armor that Saul, that he had. And then David essayed that he, he began to go. Now he's got all his armor. He began to go, but he stopped. Why did he stop? For he had not proved it. He had not tested it. 
Okay, that's like somebody giving me a weapon, a gun, for example. All right, and uh, okay, fine. And then I take it into combat and use it. Wait, wait a minute. What happened? You don't just get a weapon and then take it into combat and use it. You test it first. Make sure it works. Make sure it works. Okay, firing pin might be gone. All kinds of things might be happening. That's what you, but so it's what David is saying. He's not tested it yet. Okay, and David said unto Saul. I cannot go with these. I cannot go with these. I can't go into a battle against Goliath with these, for I have not proved them. And, and that's twice now. For I have not proved them, spoken twice. When you see th something twice in the Bible, man, that's emphasis. That's God saying, look and listen to this. This is important. Anything that appears twice, that's important. Okay? And David, what happened to him? And David put them off him. David rejected him. He rejected Saul's armor. He put them off. Let's look at the second footnote. Commentary. Saul put on, uh, put his own brass armor of sin, uh, that's his covering of sinful thoughts, that he, his sinful thoughts, okay, upon David, and David put them off. For he was not comfortable, not in harmony with them, not in harmony with them. They didn't fit. And that's what happens when you go to these churches, uh, for example, that are, they're teaching all this, this uh, uh, gobbled up uh, doctrine, uh, all, all screwed up and everything, and you feel this isn't something right here. It's just, uh, I just don't feel comfortable with this. Well, that's because <laughs> something isn't right, and you don't feel comfortable. See? Now, I'm saying if you're a saved Christian, you'll see a difference. If you're not a saved person, well, it won't make any difference. One guy is just as silly as another. But if you're a saved Christian, you'll see a difference when you're being lied to. Okay, and see, David put them off here because it didn't fit. And here's the physical symbolism that God gave us so that we understand this, okay? It, it was provided, uh, uh, the, the physical symbolism the Lord has provided is Saul was head and shoulders, and the quote is, higher than any of the people. And that 1 Samuel 9, 2 and uh, uh, 10, 23. Two times again. It appears two times. Saul was head and shoulders higher. Higher is pride than any of the people. See that? Head and shoulders higher. Repeated twice. Saul's a really bad guy. Yeah. So let's go to 1 Samuel 17 40. So after this, he, now David's put off all the armor. He's rejected the the, the standard church doctrine rejected it. Doesn't work. Doesn't fit. Why? Well, David was a holy man. I mean, he was anointed by God. Didn't fit. So he took. He refused all the armor from Saul. Seven, 1 Samuel seventeen forty, and he that's David took. Now he took his own staff, his staff, and his staff was a stick in the Hebrew for walking, striking, guiding, divining. It was a rod. He took his own rod. The shepherd, David was a shepherd, had two, actually, uh, weapons, if you want to call it that. They had a, a stick maybe maybe about this long or something. Just a, long, a stick about that long, hard stick that they used defensively to, if wolves or something were attacking or they had to smack somebody, bang, they could, they could crack them with a stick. And then they had a st they had a longer stick, which was called a staff too, and that was was uh, maybe about uh, six, seven, eight feet long, a long pole with a curve around the end of it, and the curve was for that can be six or seven feet away. I can reach out with this stick and put that curve around a, a sheep's neck and bring it back into the line again. Uh, okay, staff of correction. Okay, so this was this was a, a rod, the shorter thing. You know, Moses was given rod in, I think, Exodus chapter 3, okay? And with that rod, he did the miracles. He and Aaron did miracles uh, in, in Egypt, all those ten, 10 miracles, I think. That was all done with the rod. And the rod afterwards was given to Aaron uh, to, uh, as a leader of a tribe. And uh, it uh, uh, was put in, well, it, it, there was a test done for a variety of reasons. And, and, he, uh, and uh, the, the rod uh, produced almonds. It's a dead rod, all cut off, whatever, coming to, coming to life and producing almonds, almonds, almonds. That's the Holy Spirit doing miracles. And it's a type of shadow of us. 
Because are you saved and born again? Are you saved and born again? Yeah. You're dead to the world. Amen. Amen. But you're living with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You're resu you're going to be resurrected with Jesus Christ. Cool. You are a rod. Right. But you're going to be. <laughs> you're going to produce <laughs> almonds. When you get to heaven, you're going to produce almonds. Almonds was, was a, a very interesting um, food. Uh, has lots of very he heavy spiritual indications, heavy stuff. But you got, got the deal, dead guy? Okay, and you're dead too. And you're dead. I know a lot of you are dead. And some of you aren't dead. But you should hope to die. I mean, die to yourself. How do you die to yourself? Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Let me show you how that works. Receive the cross of Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Well, how, how do you receive the cross? Oh, what do you mean? What's going to happen? Here's what's going to happen. It's actually a sword. Mm -hmm. The cross is actually a sword. Shoo. Shoo. And you've been stuck. And you've been stuck. And you've been stuck. And you've been stuck Not afraid. and so what what is in, in a sense the word what's happening is you're actually dead mm -hmm. can, 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 can put this in your mind if you're saying morning consider your dead body and you and lie down on your back and look up see and you're lying there because you're dead and this is stuck out of your chest because that's what you are this is stuck out of your chest just like a graveyard. Mm -hmm. And they have their own monuments, they have the stone monuments. This is your monument. You're dead, and this is your monument. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. So there's many things. At this particular time before the Lord Jesus comes back, it's a it's a uh, this as crosses a cross of forgiveness. Forgiveness. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, it's going to be a sword. Yep. Yep. Get all the bad guys. <laughs> okay, but right now, you're dead, lying prostrate, with this sticking out of your chest. The cross of forgiveness. God wants to forgive you for your sins, every sin. He wants you to know that. And he wants you to receive it. Wood? What's wood symbolized in the Bible? Men. Yep. Men. Trees. Men. So now we get into the heavy stuff. And he, David, took his staff in his hand, and the Hebrew hand means power. It indicates control. David's in control of his staff, okay, uh, his, his power, okay. And, he, and uh, David took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones. And chose him, chose means selected. Let's look at our first footnote. 1 John chapter 15, verse 16. Jesus Christ says, you have not chosen me. I mean selected in the Greek, okay? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you. Ordained you for what? I've ordained you for office. Okay? Each one of you has been ordained for office, okay? All right? That you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask in the Father, I ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And what happened up here? And David, David, who's a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, remember now, what did David do? He chose him five smooth stones. Oh, wait a minute. Five smooth stones uh, out of the brook. Out of the, so here was David. And he was about to cross that brook. And he stopped in the brook. The water, what's the water again? Holy Spirit running around his ankles. And he looked down. And he chose, just like Jesus Christ chose us, he chose him five smooth stones out of the waters. Now, how do those waters, incidentally, 
Were those stones always smooth? You know, well rounded and soft and I mean, that soft. Were they always smooth? No, stones don't come smooth. They come all jagged and bent out of shape and, and hard and, and stiff and with edges in them and everything, don't they? Well, how do stones get smooth? Water. Where were these stones? In the water. Yeah. That's where they get. That's how they get with the running water, smooth stone. Millions and millions of years has been doing that. <laughs> okay. If you find stones in the creek you, they, that have been rounded, they, that have been softened, that no longer have edges, that are nice, that are not hurtful to, to hold of that. That stone's been there for probably a million years or more. Just at a at a at a shot guess. Okay. I used to like in Buffalo when I used to live up there in southern uh, anyway, I used to have a creek near where I right next to my house almost anyway, a uh, hundred yards away. And uh, I used to walk up and down the creek and see all those nice I didn't know those stones were anything but smooth stones and nice but so the nice uh, the creek was about usually ankle deep. Okay, so I could walk up and down the creek and about maybe as wide as this room, well, actually wider than this room, all right, but it's just nice water, trickling water, trickle, trickle, trickle going down. All those stones in that creek were being, were being cleansed every single day because they were being washed by that water, kept on washing. Even the water doesn't have a lot of, lot of a fr a friction in it. It's enough to smooth out a stone over a couple million years, all right? So what did he do then? Now, stones represent what in the Bible? They represent men. Hard-hearted people. Hard-hearted people. Okay, stones. That's what you and I used to be before we received Jesus Christ because we didn't know what love was. So we, we might have even been nice people, but we still didn't know what real love was until after we received Jesus Christ in our hearts. Then we knew what real love was because the Bible says he first... He first I got Bill. He first loved us. He first loved us. So he gave us his love. What's his love's name? His love's name is Jesus Christ. That's what he gave us. Mm -hmm. It went into your heart. Came into your heart and gave his love. Just for you. That's beautiful. Now, so let's look and see. He says here, David, he, David, took his staff. This is Jesus Christ in type and shadow now, coming up against. Uh, a, 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 uh, an unsaved peoples, unsaved nation, unsaved peoples. All the people in the world, for example, are not saved. Okay, that's this is a big, big picture. Okay, and he chose him five smooth stones, uh, symbolic of redeemed men who were previously were were sharp edged and hard hearted. Okay, five smooth stones out of the brook, the stream, which is symbolic of the wearing effect of the Holy Spirit. And let's look at our, our second footnote here, uh, what these stones were. And here's what they were. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. This is what they are. They are, well, let me read this. And he, that's the risen Jesus Christ, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying mean in the Greek an architecture, a structure, okay, figuratively confirmation or the building of the, the, the body of Christ because we are being built as, into one unit as, uh, as the whole body of Christ. Now let's go back to what it says. What did he give them? He gave them apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. I have to just write that in because it just has to go up on the board. I can't help it. Apostles, prophets. Did you know that everybody who speaks the inspired word of God is a prophet? I mean, you're just repeating the, 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 that word of God. And, it's, and it means that as well as it means come up with new stuff. But we're not coming up with new stuff anymore, okay? Because God gave us all the stuff right there in the Bible. Okay, so this, uh, that's, this is not new. It's been there for... Uh, uh, 2,000, 3,000 years. And it may be new to you because I'm just now bringing it up and uh, enlightening you on it. I'll open it up, that's all, okay? But now, so what we get is God gave us, uh, Jesus gave us, uh, when, he, when he left, he gave us apostles, he gave us prophets, okay? He gave us evangelists. Okay? He gave us pastors. He gave us teachers.
five smooth. Now, what I mean by five smooth stones, let me take, for example, pastor. You just don't get saved and become a pastor, do you? Because when you get saved, you got remember you got edges and sharp points and things, and you're hard-hearted. You have a little bit of space to the Lord, but you don't become automatically a pastor. So how do you get to be a pastor? You keep reading this, and this wears away your sharp edges. It softens you up because you're getting the word of God now. God's word is love. Love softens. Love wears away. Okay. That's what's happening with the as in the truth, the Holy Spirit. If God is love, the Bible says God is love twice. God is love. If God is love, then His Son Jesus Christ is love also, right? Can't get out of it. And if God and and, and Jesus Christ is love, what's the Holy Spirit? Love. So these five smooth stones are people who've been in the creek for a long, long time, and the water of the Holy Spirit, the love of the Holy Spirit, the love of the Word of God coming across to them is smoothing them out. Getting rid of the sharp edges. Getting rid of the hard things, the hard thoughts that you have all the time. Getting rid of the bad things that you know are, are not right. Okay, That's what God's doing to every one of us right now. Every one of us is in that stream right now. Every one of us is sitting there in that stream. And if you're saved and born again, I should say, you are, and you're getting, you're getting washed you're getting cleansed, you're getting softened, you're getting, you're getting worn down, uh, you're getting smoothed out by the Holy Spirit. And you're becoming your office. Pastor, teacher, evangelist, president. And also, and I also see this, that, for example, I started, I was a teacher. I started off as, uh, reading and, 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 and teaching, uh, only because I, well, anyway. And then I became a pastor. I became an evangelist, okay. Then I became a prophet okay, because I was interpreting in, inspired the Word of God for, for God. I was getting revelations. When you get revelations, what are you? <laughs> and I was really, really into the people. That's prophecy, okay. All right. And I don't think I could be an apostle until I die. But all the apostles, I think one of the criteria for, the, for to be an apostle was that you had to be uh, present in Jesus' ministry. Uh, I think I read that someplace a couple times. I'm not sure. So don't, don't, don't bet on that. But, but you know what's going to happen though? When I get the full mind of Christ, what am I going to be? <laughs> I'm going to be all them. And so are you. And so are you. With the full mind of Christ, so are you. So what happened here now? So now what? Here's what it. Jesus Christ, in the form of David, okay, is here. He's going to fight Goliath now, and he's about to cross the stream. But he stops in the stream of the Holy Spirit, and he selects, because Jesus always selects. He selects five smooth stones, five of you, five of us, out of the brook, five smooth stones, okay, and put them in his pouch. Okay, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones and put them in a, uh, uh, excuse me, five smooth stones out of the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag. Now, a shepherd means in Hebrew to tend a flock to pastor. So he was, a, David was a, a shepherd, he, he had done that uh, and, and he had a, this bag here and he put them in his bag. Okay, uh, and he put them in a shepherd's bag which he had even in a scrip. Now, I mean, it's a little bit different when he says that even in a script, the bag was more than just a plain bag. It was a script. In the Hebrew, that means a traveling pouch as if for gleanings, as if for gleanings. So, uh, and that's, I'm getting in a little off where I wanted to go in this, but a gleaning is, is well, let's, let's look at the uh, uh, third footnote. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, Thou shalt not make clean riddest of the riddest ridness. You know, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. 
So when they had, when they back there, when they had, well, of course, it was all an agrarian society. Uh, when they had well, in the fields of grain, for example, uh, uh, or barley or whatever, uh, there's a field. They well, come harvest time. They would harvest everything except they would kind of go make the corners, you know, rather than go up to the corner and get it all and then go again like this. They kind of went around here. This is the, that's the field, but rather than just go up and across, which would get everything, they harvested like this. All right. So they so they so they left some some stuff in the corners. That's for the poor poor people. That's a pretty good idea. What do you really think about that? Right? Okay? okay. That's a gleaning, and the shepherd's bag was uh, for that for gleanings as well. Now. And a shepherd's bag, and oh, now here we go. And he put them, these five smooth stones, in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip, and his sling, oh, now, was in his hand. Uh oh, now, wait a minute. His sling was in his hand. You know what a sling is, don't you? You put a, a little uh, piece of, well, it's a slingshot. You just, and then you let it go, okay? That's, uh, they, they, that was actually a, 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 a real weapon that they used, everybody used back then, okay? And, he, and his sling was in his hand. His sling was in his hand. That means power control. No one happened. And he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine means in the Hebrew, rolling, migratory, to roll in, in dust, wallow self, okay? And now we see that we stop being Goliath. We're no longer referring to this entity as Goliath. Now we begin to refer to him as the Philistine. And so we've gone into that. We just jump from Goliath, symbol of evil and sin, to the whole nation world of unsaved people. This is the ultimate big, big picture, okay? Now we're talking about the ultimate big picture. Forty times. Forty times, okay? God's trying to tell you something. When you repeat something twice, it's it's, it's emphatic, okay? Uh, nobody's ever reached it 40 times. You gotta figure, you know, maybe I'm missing something here if I didn't get that. <laughs> anyway, uh, and he drew near to the Philistine. Uh, and I have here, uh, uh, whose name was no longer Goliath, which appears only twice in this whole chapter, a name, but now the higher concept of Philistine, which is repeated 40 times, representing an all unsaved mankind composite, composite of all unsaved mankind. So now we're having the final battle here, in, the, in effect, the good and the bad. Okay, this is it. And let's see now. Now we'll go down to footnote number four. I had to, had to see this. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 29. This is a different kind of an episode entirely. It's where a woman named Abigail, who's married to a guy, guy named Nepal, which means stupid, <laughs> adult actually, stupid in the uh, in the Hebrew. But anyway, Abigail, Ab Abigail, she becomes his uh, David's wife eventually. Ab Abigail speaks to David, and here it is: Yet a man, and she's indicating Saul now. Yet a man is is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. Now, God's talking to all of us now, because there's a man, Saul, false doctrine, has risen to seek our soul, to, to deceive us, to draw us into the wrong, wrong areas, okay? And there's a man, Saul, well, see, false doctrine, is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. Now, you just stop and look at those words, because they apply to you. And what is this? It says here, But the soul of my Lord, your soul, and here's the quote, shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. Your soul will be bound together in the bundle of life with the Lord God. If you're saved and born again, that's you. Your soul, think about this, shall be bound together. Uh, 
bound together, bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. That's your destiny. You and God are going to become one. We're being, how do I say, led, taught, prayed, moved into the, into the body of Christ. We're becoming more and more the body of Christ, becoming closer and closer to each other, all right, and closer and closer to God as well. The more we read the Bible, the more we talk, the more we pray, the more we love each other, the closer we're becoming, and at the same time, we're all becoming closer to God at the same time. So we're, we're coming, kind of going like this. We're all going up. We're all going up. And it's getting narrower, narrower, and narrower the further closer we come to God. You have that to look forward to. Amen. Every one of you. You're saved and born again. Be, you're going to be, you need to mark that verse down. You need to keep that verse. You're going to, you're going to be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. Praise God. Now, isn't that a blessing? Yeah. I'm telling you, what a blessing. And we continue now, it says here, okay. Uh, Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thine enemies, now notice this, and the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. Whew. End time. You're going to be bound together with God in the bundle of life. And our enemies shall be slung out. Wow. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. So now you see the meaning here. Let's go back and look. And he, David, took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put a shepherd's, and put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand. That's power control. Sling. Or hand, I should say. And he drew near to the Philistine. Now, so we left it off there, drew near to the Philistine. So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 41 and 42. And I'll read the black face first. Coming next. And the Philistine, notice, we're still again, no more than Goliath. Now we're Philistine. Higher concept, higher concept. Big, big, big picture now. Big picture. All unsaved people in the world. All unsaved, that's what the Philistines represented. All unsaved people in the world. And the Philistine, that's unsaved mankind composite, came on and drew near unto, the, unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. Now, wait a minute. What do you mean, man that bare the shield? There's only two mentions of that in the Bible, and both of them in, 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 this, in this particular chapter. Man that bare the shield. The first mention was 1 Samuel 17, 7, which said exactly the same thing. So what they did here, when Goliath was coming down every day for 40 days, there was a fellow in front of him. Goliath's 12 foot tall. But there was a regular fellow in front of him carrying a shield. Now the shield was, of course, uh, probably six, seven foot tall uh, or more, all right? And, and, the, and the shields were not altogether, altogether protective. They were also aggressive because a, a lot of them had a hook on the end of them, a sharp hook. You could use the shield to hook somebody. Or they had a, a point on them on both ends or whatever, so that you could stab somebody with your shield too. And so what was happening is evil was coming coming at the people. Evil, as all the time, false doctrine uh, was going well, and, and the evil here over here from the Philistine was coming at the people, and, and Goliath was coming down. But in front of Goliath, there was a man that went. Uh, anyway, a shield as big as me, wide. Why was that shield? Why would the man go before Goliath? Well, the shield was to protect Goliath from anything coming at him. Also, the shield could also defend uh, defend Goliath if, if something was there. Okay. 
In our society today, we have the man with the shield. His name is the fake news media. Okay, his name is the fake news media. What's happening is, let's take it, take it as, as I'm looking at it now, and I don't mean to be prejudicial to anything, I'm just seeing things as I see them. I'm seeing the Democrats as representing the Philistines. By and large, they're all unsaved. Now, there's a few Democrats that are actually saved, but most of these Democrats are definitely unsaved people. They have no morality whatsoever, okay? Uh, no moral compass at all. They just do what they want to do. Everybody did that was right in their own eyes in the, uh, uh, what the Bible says. Everybody did that was right in their own eyes. And that's what they're doing. These are the Democrats, and what they're doing, <coughs> we are under uh, coup d'etat. We've been under coup d'etat for uh, three or four years now, okay? Which means that Somebody's trying to take over the United States of America, yeah. Yeah. period. And there's no question about that, uh, 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 that, that we're under a coup d'etat. They're, they're, they're actually, you they will tell you that they're trying to, but the Democrats are trying to take over power from the country. All right, all right. There, this guy coming down. And they come down, not only do they come down one, uh, twice a day, but they come down every hour and every half hour and every 50 minutes on the news. It's always on and on and on and on coming against Republicans, Christian believers predominantly. Republicans are Christian believers. They have a moral compass. They have standards to go by. They don't lie. And what are the Democrats doing? They have no standards. They have no moral compass. And they're lying like crazy. And they don't, it doesn't bother them at all because even if they get caught, look at the shift. Uh, he, gets, he gets caught. He doesn't care. He just keeps on lying. That, so that's all they don't, that's what they do. We're happy now, and they're protecting uh, Goliath. They're trying to foster their own powers, but they're they're protecting. Oh, I should. I want to get the, 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 the Democrats are the Goliath. Okay, and who's protecting them? The false the false news people. The false news people are running in front of them, are running behind them, running the sides, trying to protect them, shield them from from uh, 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 criticism from finding out what what's going on and we still find out but they don't care they keep on doing it now that's the big picture the false media is now this is all prophecy this is coming out why is this happening man this is all about to end the lord jesus christ is about to return that's a fact okay i mean as far as i'm as far as i'm concerned it's a fact he's about to return these things are getting better worse 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 and now when you think about it you can see the, 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 the fake news as, as, the, as the man who bear the shield who walks in front of Goliath man said man who bear that means physical man who, who bear uh, a phys, I should physic, physicality I should say men not, not uh, angels or demons but men okay who are composed of the fake news media and they're protecting that guy right there they're protecting false doctrine and they're protecting uh, which is part of him too, but they're they're protecting the 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 coup d'etat, and they're encouraging it. They're lying, and they're encouraging the coup d'etat. They're encouraging Democrats to take over uh, power in the United States of America. Now I'm going to tell you something. From my point of view, the way I've seen humanity act before in history is only one result that's going to come up to. Bang bang, guns in the streets. That's going to be it because. When they, the Democrats get to the point where they keep backing up and they keep, keep aggressively trying to keep... Uh, uh, but sooner or later, they're going to be backed up to the point where they can't talk anymore and, and then they're just going to go out and start... Because it's all their power. These people have been in office, these politicians have been in office for, for 20, 30, 40 years, some of them, okay? They, and, and all these the Democrats they have, they have these tremendous amounts of power, influence, that they're being cut off because... Trump is, is cleaning up the swamp, okay? And uh, eventually, they're going to get down to the point where they no longer can even talk anymore. And they're talking in, unintelligibly now. And the things that they say don't make any sense. But pretty soon, it's going to be guns in the streets. And then I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and, and take us out. Maybe just before that, I don't know. Okay? But that's what that's happening. And here's the shield. They walk before him, appears twice. Important, no name, because it's prophecy. 
Thank you. Okay, one Samuel 17, 41 and 42. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine, as unsaved mankind composite, looked about and saw David, he disdained David. He disdained him. Disdain means he disesteemed him. He despised him. He found him contemptible. He thought to scorn him. He thought, thought David a vile person. Isn't that what they think of Christians now? Yes. What do they think of Christians, you think? What do you think the whole country thinks of Christians? We used to be on top, admired and respected. Now we're at the bottom. We're the only group that you can actually make fun of and have jokes of and laugh and, and, and make uh, uh, whatever. And nobody says anything. It's okay. Why? Because the country has learned, been taught to disdain us, to disesteem us, to despise us, to find us contemptible, to think to scorn us, to find us vile. Okay. They're doing that to us and have done that now. We are. See, when David, well, I'm, I'm saying David is a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Boys and girls, he's a type and shadow of us. We're a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, aren't we? Yes. David's a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. And we're a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Yep. And what, what Goliath is doing and the false media is exactly what was happening to David. Disdained, despised, contemptible, scorned. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy, ruddy, of, and of a fair countenance. Well, a fair countenance means his appearance, okay? But Ruddy's interesting here. Because uh, if you look at what Ruddy, Ruddy R-U-D-D-Y, means in the Hebrew, it means uh, of reddish of, of the hair or complexion. Reddish of the hair or complexion. To show blood, in, maybe perhaps even blonde to a degree. To show blood in the face. A flush or turn rosy. David was... Oh, and it says he had a fair countenance. I mean, he's a beautiful countenance. He was beautiful. David was beautiful. See, wasn't Jesus Christ beautiful? Yeah. But yeah. we can't see that. All we see him all torn up or banged up or whatever. But he was beautiful. He was love. Love is beautiful. Okay. But what are we looking at here? We're looking at Jesus Christ. Uh, and my commentary is this. Uh, Ruddy, that's interestingly, this description might also prophetically be applied to President Trump. Yep. President Trump is a confessing Christian right now. Okay, I think he got saved when he got, when he, the night that he uh, uh, obtained the presidency, I think it was too much for him. He turned his life over to God. Yep. I believe he did do that, and he became a Christian. I don't think he was before that. Now he's a Christian, okay. I don't know how that figures in, to tell you the truth. But it's just kind of interesting that now that we have, for the first time in how many years, we've got a real <laughs> guy in the office who's really doing things, okay, and he's not a politician. This is all the different than anything that's ever happened before. Right? Always been politicians about politicians about politicians. Right? Now it's this guy who's a businessman, and he's, he's doing wonderful things for us in terms of our economy. All right. Anyway... So, so, so what happened now? The Philistine laughed him to scorn. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 43 and 44. And the Philistine, that's the unsaved mankind composite, said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? Cursed be uh, that thou comest to me with staves. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field. <laughs> well, it didn't work. And I'm not going to do the rest of it today. And I might not ever do it. I don't know. Because I just don't feel like I, I don't want to push. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm your host. You've come and I've laid a table before you of all kinds of goodies, 
revelations, this revelation, that revelation, this insight, that insight, this new thought, that insight. And you've taken, you've taken what you wanted. You've chosen and picked the ones to understand. And others that you don't understand, you just let go and you don't, you don't take them in anymore, okay? But I have a time, you have a time thing. Right? I, uh, I, I, I don't want to burden you with more when you've already been stuffed because it's not going to make much of a difference anymore. <laughs> you, can't get, can't, you get to the point after a while where you can't get any more in, you know. Just, hey man, I've had it. I just need a break here. I need to go. Whatever. So what we're going to do is we're going to end it right there. But I want you to know that there's much, much more to these stories in the Bible than what you think there are. And do, you, do any of you ever think anything like this? It would come out of David and Goliath? I don't think so. <laughs> yes, you take the, these things with you. I, I may uh, do it next week. I may not. But you're never going to go anyplace if you don't do something. That's the truth. You got to do something. You can't just get saved and sit back and wait to go to heaven. Ain't going to work. You got to do something. Okay. Here's what you got to do. You got to follow up this story. You got to follow up in the Bible, okay? You got, you got the sheet there. Follow up and see what it's all about. See what happens, okay? Uh, we win, incidentally. Just to let you know ahead of time, okay? All right. Uh, and I want you to oh, just bless us all. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask that you just bless this meeting, these people, uh, with more of you, Lord. More of you, more of your love. More of your... <laughs> more of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, Jesus Christ said this in John 3, 3. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, except a man, he said. He didn't say, if you study hard, he said. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How do you get born again? Romans 10 9 explains it best that I can see that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be born again. Okay? It's as simple as that. All you have to do, now I'm going to say a prayer and I'm going to ask if you want to get saved and born again, that you say this prayer with me and you can receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and begin. It's not the ending, it's the beginning of a brand new life. Of a, because it's going it to come with different attitudes, a different moral structure than what you have now. A different everything. And it's all going to be related to love. It's all going to be related to love. What a wonderful thing. That it's all going to be related to love. Isn't that wonderful? So I ask now, is there anybody here today who would like to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior? Please raise your hand and I'll say a prayer with you. Anyone at all? Anyone at all? Yes. Are you saved? Are you already saved? You are? Okay. Well, we're looking for new people. That's good. That's fine. Well, you can say this in a minute, but we're looking for new people. Anyone at all? Okay. Well, we have an internet congregation. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> howdy, folks. <laughs> I don't know who's there and who's not there, but we're going to say a prayer for them. And for those who would like to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior on the internet, please raise your hand. Well, I can't see you, but Jesus, God can see you. That's what's important. Raise your hand, and now I'm going to say this prayer. Now, for you folks here who are, we've studied already that you're angels, okay? Some good, some bad. If you'd like to say this prayer uh, with me, and act like a chorus of heavenly angels escorting these people to the door. Uh, please stand up and say this prayer with me. Oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, dog walk came out of no place. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to say this prayer now. Let, uh, uh, let's do it. Let's be commence. Father God, Father God. I, confess I'm a I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died, on the cross died on the cross and paid the penalty, paid the penalty for, all for all my sins and was resurrected. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father God, Father God please, send your son, please send your son, your seed, your love into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Hallelujah. Please be seated. Please be seated. I'm going to take the, uh, uh, send the, Okay, uh, what, uh, why don't you come forward too? Tell you you're going to take tithes and offerings. I need, come on, for you. Take the plastic plate back and forth for the tithes and offerings. That way. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Tithes and offerings, tithes and offerings. Why do we do tithes and offerings? Last book of the Old Testament. Lord God said, uh, <laughs> uh, your tithe is like a 10% is a 10% of your increase uh, for the week. So if you made $10 this week, your tithe is actually a dollar that goes in the bucket. It's the most important money. It's the most important thing you can do with your money, quite frankly, because God said, if you obey me, I'll bless your socks off. I'll bless you so that you cannot contain the blessings. Okay. And the only way to find out if that's true is just to do it. You have to test God. And God said, the only place in the Bible he said, test me, he said, test me with the tithes. Okay? He said, well, the quote is actually, try me in the Old Testament, which means in Hebrew, test. Okay? You can test him with the tithes and see. In other words, tithe a few weeks and see if it didn't change your life. It changed mine. It'll change yours. It changes everybody's life I've ever met. Okay? So it's God working. And God says, if you're tired, I will bless, uh, bless your socks. I'll bless uh, you more blessings. You cannot contain all the blessings uh, that uh, that will pour down upon you. And for those of you who don't tithe, let me remind you this. that He also said, for those of you who don't tithe, he said, and then people people complain or whatever, say, well, how come, well, 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 well well, what do you mean by tithe? And God said, in tithes and offerings, okay? And God said, to those who don't tithe, would you rob God? No way. That's a quote. Whoa. No way. Now, how about that? He's saying, you don't tithe, you're robbing God. God said it, I didn't. Now, how important do you think that tithe is? <laughs> That's very, very important to God. Now, that may be maybe so important to you, but it's very, very important to God. Because the tithe is the first step in obedience. Okay? And, the, and the obedience is the first step in loving. You can't be disobedient to someone and love them at the same time. Obedience is the first step in loving. And God wants you all to love Him because he is love. And if you love him, what he really wants, he wants you to love him. He is love. So love is actually understanding. He wants you to understand him. That's how you love. By understanding. Like two people who don't understand each other are going to bang around like this for a long, long time. But if they start understanding each other, they start to become one. In the eyes of God and with God, this is a big deal. So, so I, I kick you every every a week. I kick you guys uh, about the tithe, but okay, the, the amount is not important. It's doing it, doing it. If you only made a dollar this week and you throw ten cents in that bucket, man, you obeyed God. You did it. And I know how precious that dollar was. If that's all you made, that's precious. See, that's like the widow's mite. She threw in. The businessman came and throwing in tithes and offers, and they threw all kinds, $50,000, this, that, so, so on. And the poor little widow came in, and she had two mites, just like two pennies. And the Bible says she threw all, in all that she had. She had it all. Now, how important do you think that was? She gave everything to God. Give God your everything. What is your everything? It's your time. What's the most important thing that you have? 
your time. Everybody here is going to die. Everybody's going to die. You have only a limited amount of time left to make decisions. And when you come to church, what are you doing? You're giving God your time. That's a blessing in itself. You see that? Praise God. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord. I ask that you bless, it. <laughs> bless all these people with more of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We're going to ask uh, uh, Chef Lennox to uh, give the uh, food. food. Really? Because why? Is because, number one, he is a chef. Number two, he and p -Tech, uh, Pinellas Technical College does lots and lots of, of things for us, okay? And he, hel he helps us a lot. And this guy is also on the board of directors, so be nice to him. Okay, hit it. <laughs> hit it now. <laughs> uh, Father God, in the name of all Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we like to thank you for the spiritual food that we receive here today. Uh, we like to also uh, thank you for providing uh, the mission with food uh, that we feed so many hundreds of people every week. Uh, we like to bless the hands that prepare the food today for us to consume. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless God. Stars are brightly shining. It is the night of the dear Savior's